Today's episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast is brought to you by Poor Richard's Cafe and Star Local Media. Poor Richard's Cafe, Plano's oldest restaurant since 1973. They are open daily from 5.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., serving the three most important meals of the day, breakfast, lunch, and dessert. It is true Texas homestyle cooking made with love and grit at his Poor Richard's Cafe, located off of Avenue K in Plano. Welcome to another episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. My name is Matt Welch. I'm the sports editor at Star Local Media, and I am being joined by Brian Murphy and Taylor Raglan. It is a uh, it is a happening time right now in the high school sports scene. Be it you know teams that are prepping for uh, you know state tournament action in track, golf, or tennis. At some point in the coming weeks, we have the baseball playoffs that are starting this week. Heck, we had the NFL draft last week, and all sorts of local flavor there. And we'll actually talk about that later on in the podcast. But for now, let's play a little little bit of catch up on softball first rounds in the books the field of 128 has been cut in half so uh, as uh, as teams embark on their area around matchups later on this week let's um let's just at least talk about some of the teams that are still standing nevertheless through one round and a few that aren't but nevertheless let's start with the happy side of things the teams that are bound for the second round including uh, i guess uh three programs out of district 96a that just mm-hmm. took care of business in their respective series we'll get to 5a action later on we'll start with 6a um so district 96a they go through Three and one overall against District 106A in the by district matchups. Um, Taylor, you got to see the most uh, lopsided of them all. Yeah. I mean, Plano West, uh, after playing, uh, you know, the the brutality of that District 96A schedule and the first round for Plano West, that game had to feel like, wait a minute, what is this? We can we can have games like this? Yeah. It was it was a little bit expected, I think, as far as just I think they knew they were. The more talented team, I think they knew that they'd be able to get to, um, you know, the Rowlett Arms. Pretty much anybody they threw out there. We should clarify: they beat Rowlett nineteen to two. Yeah, right. yeah. It was. I was. I was eventually yeah, yeah. getting there, but I mean, it, it's. It was nineteen to two. It, it, it honestly wasn't that close. I mean, it was yeah. thirteen to nothing after the first inning. Um, so, and and that first inning, honestly, for Rowlett is is a little bit of a what might have been. I think that. You know, eventually West is still going to do what they do. But mm-hmm. at one point, you know, they had a, a ground ball hit to second base after I think four or five runs had mm-hmm. scored and a chance to get out of the inning, maybe down four or five. That goes sideways, two more score, two home runs. Uh, it, everything else happens, and all of a sudden you're down 13 and, and your season's over, and everybody knew it, you know, mm-hmm. after the first yeah. after the first thing. They were literally, Plano West was, was having girls leave early on purpose. Um, no, just no. to kind of move things along, it was it was not it was not a pretty scene. Um, they they certainly weren't trying to run up the score or anything. It was just an offensive onslaught. And, and maybe like you said, they were finally like, man, you know, this is our our chance to just kind of unleash on somebody after you know the hell that that nine six a often mm-hmm. is. But you know the the takeaway is that you're going to get right back into that kind of grind and and right back into that you know competitive mindset if you want to continue to advance because. You know they're they're moving on to play a Waco Midway team that Tatum Boyd uh, no hit in in tournament action, but who knows what the case was? It was a Saturday mm-hmm. tournament game, yeah. the end of the tournament. Who knows what was going on? I mean Tatum Boyd is obviously going to give them an edge over just about anybody, um, you know, both in the circle and at the plate. But you know at the same time you can't <coughs> expect to go out and no hit somebody in the postseason. That's not usually what happens. Maybe, but you know it's a three game series uh, with Waco Midway. You know, a, a no hitter, like I said, in the playoffs is is unlikely. Teams are going to show up. It's going to be hard fought. So, you know, for West, I think the important part is kind of getting back to. And, and head coach Mike Ledsom said the same. You got to get back to kind of that mentality that you had in district. That it's going to be a dogfight every single day. You got to show up like, um, you know, and take every out and, and every pitch. Uh, you can't take any off and and really just kind of show up and take it a game at a time because you know they have the talent. And, and mm-hmm. you know, the, the team and, and the offense, especially to back up Tatum Boyd to make a really lengthy postseason run. But, you know, the class that you won't get there if you're not, you know, focusing on, on what's in front of you. So do I think that, you know, they're the better team um, in this series of Wiggle Midway? Probably. But there's a lot of factors. Weather is going to be insane. they got to drive to Cleburne mm-hmm. uh, for all three games uh, for the neutral site. Um, starts, we're recording this on Wednesday. It starts tonight, actually. So, um the, it's a weird kind of timing with Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Could get pushed to Saturday, depending on the weather. There's a lot of factors and, and a lot of outside noise and distraction and, and previous results and everything else. So, 
you know, West has been good thus far at kind of centering and, and doing what they do and taking it one game at a time and, and kind of following behind um, Elisa Rosado and Tatum Boyd and, and some of their other leaders. So if they continue to do that, man, it's they're not all going to be 19-2, to two, but but nope. I could see them uh, engineering a, a pretty good run. So we'll see. Yeah, Brian, you saw, I mean, with something pretty similar with, uh, with what Prosper did to Garland. It wasn't one game. They had to play a best-of-three series, but that best-of-three series, Prosper collectively outscores Garland, what, 27-0? to zero? Mm -hmm. what? Poor Garland, man. <laughs> they endured, I mean, they we didn't kind, it. We kind of intimated on the preview podcast last week that once you get past the Wileys and the Saxies, there's yeah. a pretty clear line of demarcation between those two and the rest yep. of 10 6 a and that mm -hmm. you might get some results that are a bit more lopsided than you know what you'd expect out of a first round playoff matchup. And Taylor just alluded to how tough it is to throw a no hitter in the playoffs. Well, Alyssa Griffin uh, in game one, she threw a no hitter against Garland. There you go. Uh, complete, yeah, well, five innings. Yeah, they went the, the run rule distance. Yeah. Uh, and this one struck out seven, did not allow. She allowed one base runner uh, on a walk. So dominant pitching performance there. Uh, like you said, 27 total runs scored. But the going gets tougher this week, uh, just like it is for Plano West. They're yeah. facing Wickham Midway. Plano, uh, Prosper's taking on Belton. You know, yeah. Belton state ranked. Uh, I crunched a little bit of numbers. You know, Prosper against state ranked teams so far this year. They're 0 and 4. Uh, against the likes of Keller. That's not promising, Brian. Plano West, two losses to Plano West, and then a loss to 5A Forney, who is no very, very well could be <laughs> yeah, the best team sure. in all of 5A. Uh, yeah, so 0-4 oh, oh in those games. Uh, Belton comes in. They're they're one of the three number 10s on this 6A. I don't know how they determine those. Sometimes they'll put in like five number 10s mm -hmm. on the rankings, but Belton's nonetheless is one of them. They're uh, deservingly so. They went undefeated in their in their district play. They're 27 and 6. Uh, I couldn't tell you any of their their players by name or who you know who their ace is or or whatnot, but you know just just looking on paper, looking at previous results, Belton, this one should be a much tighter series than what they just uh, endured against Garland. Uh, game one of that one is uh, tonight, uh, 7 p.m. All these games are in Waco, so they have to travel. Both teams will travel neutral site. They'll play at Baylor softball field okay. uh, tonight at 7. And then game two, uh, 6 p.m. Game three, if necessary, will be right after. That's almost so. like... Belton want to flip though, even though it's neutral. I mean, that's a that's a much that's oh, yeah. a much lengthier hike for Prosper. Think about Prosper. Belton. You're coming from the north oh, of yeah. the Metroplex, the very tip top, uh, on your way to Oklahoma, really. And then you got to go all the way through Dallas and Belton. Just a quick little drive up to Waco. So we'll see how that how that goes for the Prosper Eagles and Todd Rainwater's first uh, first year as head coach. There you go. Our uh, our other postseason, our I guess our other second round bound team out of District 96A, Plano Senior. Um, they were able to take care of Saxe, albeit in three games. Um, this was just a case of history repeating itself. I was going to say, just like last year. Yeah, because just like last year, Plano drops its first playoff game. Last year they lost to Marcus in their by district opener, and then this round Saxe shuts them out three nothing. One hits Plano, so all of a sudden a Plano team that the offense was a little up and down throughout district play. You're thinking, oh boy, okay, so they might have a have a bit of a dogfight on their hands. Obviously. Saxe's pitcher Maddie Boyd is a uh, is nothing to trifle with, and you know she certainly makes an emphatic statement there in Game One, and and um, I think though from that point on though just getting more and more repetitions against her, they just mm -hmm. began to get much more comfortable, and you saw that with what they were able to do in Games Two and Three, collectively outscoring Saxe twelve to zero in those two games. Shutouts, second time all season, plan up, you know Plano's posted back to back shutouts. They blank the Lady Mustangs four zero in Game Two, eight zero in Game Three. So naturally means a stellar uh, performance in the circle by Audrey McNeil, who um, this was at kind of right around this time last year when we began to really kind of yep. learn, oh yeah, okay, Audrey McNeil is for real, you know, because she was, uh, she saw you just sparse duty last year during district play, but then she was their pitcher during mm -hmm. that run to the state semifinals last year. With a healthy uh, Bronte Roden at yeah. points, I mean, they still rode McNeil, and man, yeah. Because she was the, uh, I mean, she was the uh, the hot arm, and she was able to uh, pick up, so she's, I mean, she's no stranger to no. pitching, you know, to pitching in the playoffs, pitching, you know, those big time postseason performances. And, you know, she has 14 strikeouts in their two wins. Like I said, back-to-back -back shutouts. And she got the requisite run support. You know, after being, you know, one hit in game one, Plano immediately strikes in the first inning of game two, gets a quick 2-0 lead. Um, and then in game three, for the first time in quite a while, the power game came into play for Plano. This was a team that hit more home runs during last year's playoff run than some teams will hit over the course of an entire season. Um, long ball hasn't necessarily been as much of a factor for Plano this year, but they do 
get uh, home runs from Bella Bishop and Natalie O'Brien in um, in their 8-0 victory in Game 3. And yeah, said despite a, an early hiccup, just like last year, say, so, hey, you know what, if that's a sign of things to come, then I'm yeah. sure Plano will take it just fine. It seemed to work out just just well for them uh, for them last year. And um, now they draw a, a rock wall team that, much like you know y'all's respective matchups with Western Prosper, for a significant uptick in difficulty. Rockwall um, had a, uh, they kind of had their way with District 11 6A en route to a uh, an 11 and 1 district record. This series will be um, at Rockwall Heath, just because they had, I mean, turf fields are uh, mm. are in abundance this yep. week with uh, with the inclement weather on its way. So Plano played, I mean, Plano is at least familiar with that. They did play Saxe at Rockwall Heath, but obviously proximity-wise, that is just a stone's throw away from Rockwall versus Plano having to make a bit of a lengthier drive. So not really a neutral site in uh, you know in name, but uh, nevertheless, so yes, Plano bound for the second round once again. Um, let's see. The one team that we had uh, out of District 96A that came close to at least putting a little bit of a, a little bit of a Scare and Wiley, but ultimately falling short as McKinney Boyd. They uh, they get swept away in two games. Uh, Boyd, which you know needed a, a playing game in order to mm -hmm. get that uh, that last playoff spot. And you know we talked about just as long as you have a pitcher of the caliber of Kinsey Cackley, you're going to have a fighting chance just about every time out. And you see in game one just how like what kind of a, an impact she has because this game went ten innings. Wiley, who mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. one of the best teams in the state, and <laughs> Cackley was enough of an equalizer on her own to where you know that game went 10 innings if Boyd squeaks that one out then who knows what happens but nevertheless um, you know Wiley was able to get a 4-3 victory and then Wiley was being no hit through five innings in game two I mean so they just they couldn't solve Kinsey Cackley flat out so they only had three hits off Cackley in, a, in game one only four in game two mm -hmm. but um, they finally string together that big inning Wiley gets seven runs in the sixth inning of game two uh, four hits three walks one error all contribute to that frame. Those are Wiley's only four hits of the game, but <laughs> nevertheless, I mean, that's that's all they needed is they get an A2 victory. Pretty rare that you see Boyd give up a you know a seven-run yeah. inning, but I mean, yeah, it was just a uh, again a kind of a perfect storm of events there. And Boyd actually had led the game, you know, two-zero at that point in game two. So, um, you know, a, a spirited effort by the Lady Broncos, despite being the four seed out of nine six A. And um, yeah, it just kind of reiterates just how important to have that dominant pitcher. Well, yeah, <laughs> and how interesting. I mean, it, it, softball is so much more interesting than baseball. In I mean, it's in different ways, but the fact that you can have one pitcher and just roll her out there every single game mm -hmm. back to back, like mm -hmm. this West series, if it goes three games with. Waco Midway, Tatum Boyd's probably going to throw all three games yep. on back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days. Like, they're not shy about that. It's it's just natural. It's what they do. So, you know, it's it's such a, it's an interesting storyline when, you know, how does that take a toll on, on pitchers that, you know, can normally handle it? Mm -hmm. They have one bad day or they get a little more fatigued than maybe normal in, in a series like this. And, you know, you lean so much on these these premier arms mm -hmm. that you know almost sometimes maybe you don't develop things under them or you don't have things under them and then you know one bad inning or, or one tired outing and and you're done so it's such a it's such a weird um, dynamic to to just run the same person out there over and over and in Plano's case you know you you solve somebody mm -hmm. that can happen too it's like well I just mm -hmm. saw you yesterday and now you know now we got to figure it out so it's a weird uh it's a weird storyline, I guess, for all these teams and for, for softball in general. Kinsey Cackley, over the course of just two games against Wiley, 40 strikeouts. <laughs> 40. That's her postseason debut. Over the course of two like games, a video game. <laughs> she averages 20 strikeouts. Now, granted, obviously, like I said, one of those games did go extra innings, so that contributed to it. Yeah, she had 24 strikeouts in uh, in, huh. in game one against uh, against Wiley. So yes, one of the very best offenses in the uh, in the Metroplex. Um, ultimately, yeah, they just, they go the way of many other <laughs> powerhouses uh, that have crossed Boyd this season. Now, Tackley does have 12 walks, so, so that did you know help mm -hmm. Wiley at least kind of jumpstart a little bit of offense when they weren't able to she get. She had a little bit of that in the playing game gets mm -hmm. east that I covered. That was kind of maybe her one downfall toward the end of the year. I don't know if, you know, it is fatigue or mm -hmm. or, you know, the the pressure of of, you know, knowing you're this good but also kind of making one of your first runs for the postseason. But she struggled a little bit with that even though they beat East and, and she was dominant when she was in mm -hmm. the strike zone. But they can come back to get you. So yeah, so we had uh, three playoff teams from nine six A bound for the second round. Looking um I guess at the rest of our six A landscape um, it was a sad time in District 6, yeah. 6 and you don't usually yep. say that when it comes to this time of year. This is traditionally one of the better softball districts in the state when you just think of Louisville ISD and Capel programs that are pretty familiar with making extensive runs in the playoffs. 
Nope, they are swept. Mm -hmm. A 4-0 sweep. This was, I mean, you, I mean, you heard last week Justin Thomas just going into, I mean, all of these marquee matchups with them, and then you know those five six A programs, your Kellers, your Northwest Eaton's guy, or South Lake Carroll. Um, I mean, these were some of the most highly anticipated first round matchups in the area, and Louisville ISD and Capel gets <laughs> they get swept. So that's why Justin's not here this week. He couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't handle the heat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was tough because you look at some of those, and I mean, there's ones like you know with with Keller taking out Capel, Northwest Eaton taking out Hebron. I mean, yeah, Eaton and Keller are two of the best teams in the state, and they figured to be around for quite some time in the playoffs. Uh, the big shocker, and this was, I mean, one of the more dramatic series um, in the entire state, was uh, was South Lake Carroll, the four seed, pulling the shocker over Flower Mound, mm -hmm. a Flower Mound team that went three rounds deep last year. Um, if not for if not for getting tripped up by Plano, that Flower Mound team was good enough to get to the regional final, I think. Um, and they were in position once again as the uh, as the one seed and. When you know, but a South Lake program that's you know their softball you know is maybe uh, is a bit on the come up, nevertheless. Um, but they, uh, I mean, they score just a signature win for that program in taking out Flower Mound in three games. Um, the big issue with this one is Flower Mound just could not keep the ball inside the park <laughs> from South Lake. South Lake has six home runs in this series, including three in Game Three, including the go-ahead runs in the bottom of the sixth inning on a two-run shot by Piper Harness um, that eventually gave the Lady Dragons a seven to six victory. Um, nevertheless, I mean, this one was not on the Flower Mound offense. It seems almost unfathomable that a team can lose a best of three series when you average 10 runs per game hmm. over the course of that series. So, I mean, the Flower Mound offense, they scored 12 runs in game one, 12 runs in game two, uh, six runs in game three. I mean, they uh, their bats were just as electrifying. I mean, they, they, they averaged 10 runs per game. They totaled 36 hits in this series and lost um, yeah that just seems very very difficult to do um, but Kenna Andrews Flamont had a particularly good series she had six RBIs including two home runs in that uh, that game two victory for Flyer Mound. but yeah I mean just some some shootouts in this one said South Lake won game one 13 to 12 won game three seven to six um, yeah so some clutch clutch offense by South Lake as they are on to the second round weird times for for 6 6 a over the last three years because we looked back like yeah. surely it's been a long time since all four you know playoff or all four programs of you know that that Hebron Louisville Flower Mound those teams mm -hmm. it was 2016 yeah. they all missed out and then last year um, or in 20 yeah in 2018 Flower Mound was the only one I believe you know since 2016 that Flower Mound run to the third round they got tripped up by Plano is the only time that any of them advanced to the area round mm -hmm. or beyond so it's a weird you know as good as all those teams are they've been matched up in the first round with some tough whether it be you know Plano schools whether it be obviously the the South Lakes and, mm -hmm. and even those you know the the really good Kellers and, and uh, programs of the world but man it's yeah a little bit of a, a tough run elsewhere um, I guess throughout that by district slate you had uh, Marcus getting tripped up by Denton Geyer this was just a one game series but nevertheless Geyer wins that one three to one um, a very defensive minded game this was one to one heading into the top of the seventh uh, Geyer those strikes with two runs during the top of the seventh for a uh, for that three one victory Marcus ultimately though held to just three hits just they weren't able to get it going at all against a uh, Geyer pitcher Rancy Willis um, just the first time all year that Marcus was held to one run so nevertheless a very uncharacteristic outing for uh, for the lady marauders but yeah that's just the kind of stuff that can happen at this time of year as you saw in the with their uh, with their rivals in uh in flower mound and then you had eaton and Cape and keller which you know those results were a bit more a bit more expected mm -hmm. although capel put up a respectable fight you know they uh you know they lose to uh, to keller which i mean i can see you looking at the rankings brian keller's what i mean what are they right right now in 6a two two yeah number two in 6a um you know capel only loses five to two so nevertheless this wasn't a, I mean, they didn't get run ruled or anything like that. A spirited effort, but um, ultimately, though, the lady, the uh, I guess the cowgirls are undone by four errors, um, and they just they had their struggles mustering offense against uh, that star pitcher out of Keller, uh, Dylan Kadurka. Uh, Capel struck out 12 times in the loss. They only got two hits, albeit triples by uh, Caitlin O'Quinn and Chloe Barker. So at least they made them count, and nevertheless. Um, but yeah, I mean, just you, you got to have a little bit more just in two hits if you're going to put a little, you know, put some fear into a Keller team that could very well be playing at the state tournament later on this uh, this season. And then um, then with Eaton, you had them sweeping Hebron. This one was a, a bit more lopsided than these other ones. You know, you had Eaton, which collectively outscored uh, Hebron 26 to three 
in the Yikes. series. They collectively out hit Hebron 26 to four. Um, you know, two of those hits by Hebron come from uh, from Macy Macy Noose, um, but nevertheless, I mean, just a rough a rough go for the Hebron offense. They get no hit in the the trend of uh, first round no hitters at this uh, at this table. They get uh, they get no hit in game two by Eaton pitcher Madeline Wright. So um, you know, uh, a tougher go for Hebron than the rest of the. Uh, of the 6-6-A bunkmates, and yeah, a, a rarity to not have a 6-A Louisville ISD team bound for the second round. You know what happened in, like you said, Taylor, in 2016, albeit that was when they were sharing the district with Plano yeah. ISD, and Flower Mound was yeah. the only team to make the playoffs that year. They got tripped up, tripped up by, I want to say it was Keller Timber Creek that season, might have been, um, but before that, though, I don't know, it might be a bit of a ways back since you saw yeah, it, the it, last postseason when multiple 6-A Louisville ISD yep. teams made the playoffs and didn't get out of the first round, so a, um, a definitely a bit of a historical anomaly this first round was but yeah that's i mean you know the you know the heavyweights that are in that uh, in that five six eight district so yeah i guess in, in the end maybe you can't be too surprised but yeah so uh, a little bit of uh some ups and downs throughout our coverage area for the uh, for the first round of the playoffs at least in 6a um what happened in 5A, though? Well, Brian, you saw plenty of that over in Frisco, um, plus some happenings with McKinney North and whatnot, and we will uh, do a quick line change and discuss some of the happenings and observations from the first round of the 5A softball playoffs in just a moment. And we are back to continue looking back on the first round of the high school softball playoffs. We're going to focus on 5A for this uh, this part of the podcast. And for that, we've brought along Brian Murphy and Kendrick Johnson uh, as we touch on some Frisco ISD, some McKinney North, Colony, Little Elm, go a bunch of different directions. We were actually just discussing, though, the bi-district series between 9-5A and 10-5A, which was a dead heat, 2-2. Two to two. Um, Was that the expectation for you guys heading into this week? For me, yeah. For my man over here, <laughs> nope. he hasn't caught up the message that 9-5A is here to play and they're going to beat the Frisco team in every sport not every sport every sport yeah you, I mean they have the advantage in everything including soccer and <laughs> softball and now baseball gets going this week I'm shocked so how, how uh, do you winning how not five keep splitting I'm not shocked that Lone Star lost to North even though that was a great series went three games what shocked me was Denison beating Centennial man the bomb squad man the hardest hitting <laughs> team in all of Frisco and they they lost a pair of run one run games eight to seven and six to five uh, against Den- Denison. Don't know anything about Denison <laughs> except that they were the three seed in the district. And who knows? Maybe you know Centennial losing that regular season finale against Independence with the district title on the line. If they win that game against Independence, they don't have to deal with Denison, who yeah. apparently is this you know juggernaut in in ten five a. But that shocked me. I mean Centennial still scored runs, but. Uh, like I mentioned, I believe it was only three times in 18 games that they didn't score 10 runs in, in district play, and they were held below 10 runs in both games against Denison. So that one threw me for a loop, and you know, a sweep if, too. Yeah, yeah. back to back games, they're eight to seven, six to five. That really threw me for a loop. And if any team was going to lose their their series against 10-5, I thought it would be against McKinney North, given the one versus the four. North, a really good team, but that Denison Centennial series was a uh, was a shock to me the way they did it too if that would have gone three games it would have been less surprising but oh well shout out to uh, to Denison yeah Denison <laughs> along with McKinney North getting wins on the 10-5a side of that equation you had Independence and Reedy advancing out of 9-5a Kendrick you were all up in that McKinney North series it's, cra- um, it's crazy because um the game one I didn't go to game one there was a total of five home runs here it's like a, a launching <laughs> pad and North won seven to six and that ended up being the pivotal game Game two, Lone Star puts on a show. Shout out to Morgan Reeve. She's a talented first mm-hmm. baseman. My, um, my man Murphy can attest here. She, she hit so many foul balls. Like one of them went from the softball field into the baseball diamond. They were playing. I, I know you've been into the Jason Parks at um, North, but she hit, I mean, at Prosper, but she hit uh, two doubles off the wall to set the tone. And they just basically. Got the mojo from game one, turned it and flipped it on McKinney North and tied the series up, winning 5-0. So game three, nobody knows what to expect except the Lady Bulldogs. Hmm. They came in, they had won 13 games in a row until that loss, and they basically had the mentality is, we didn't come this far not to get in the second round. As the program has been to the playoffs every year that they existed, so it's 19 years and counting, but they have not gotten out of the first round. 
until this week in nine years. So wow. breaking that first round curse was a big thing. So they show up to the field on Saturday and they literally flipped it on Lone Star and beat them 5-0 yep. and got all the big hits. And they got that momentum going in. Props to um, Reagan Kaplan, the... Um, Kleppy, the pitcher, she was couldn't hit her spots consistently on Friday, and then it was like odds to watch another pitch. Did I see you pitch last night? And see her on Saturday, she had her spot. She had um, Lone Star all off balance, shut down Reeve. Reeve went. I don't even think Reeve got a hit in um, the pivotal game. I'm looking right now, game changer. Yep, three. For, she was zero for three after being three for three with the walk on um, Friday. So the series really means something in yeah. softball because each game is its own entity and North took full advantage of that. And now they move on to play uh, uh, Highland Park team, which I'm favoring them to win and head to the regional quarterfinal final for the first time in 10 years. With uh, with Frisco ISD, Brian, be it Reedy. Now you were at that game against mm-hmm. Lovejoy, right? Mm-hmm. On, on it, was a, it was a one game, yeah. one game playoff. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, that was back and forth. Yeah. That that was wild. Reedy, you know, took a two nothing lead on him early, and then uh, Lovejoy battled right back. They had a monster inning in the third inning, I believe. They took a three two lead, and then the Wark sisters, you know, Michaela, she was in the on the cir- in the circle, uh, and Maya Wark, uh, you know, a monster at the plate. She hit a solo home run to tie it, and then a few innings later, Michaela Wark, who pitched a great game uh, in, in the circle, she hit a, a two run double to take the lead for mm-hmm. good. Uh, and they tacked on another run, and Lovejoy made it interesting at the end. They tacked on two more, and it was it was man. I thought we were about to go into extra innings. It had that <laughs> had that feel to it. It was really evenly matched, uh, and then Reedy hung on to win six to five. And now they take on Creekview, who <laughs> they, they just won their first uh, uh, first round game. Was it twenty six to nothing? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> Good for, lord, for a second yeah, yeah. And Creek they're state ranked right now too. Yeah. That was what last time I checked. Creek 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 they, they've been rolling in all their sports. They they went to the regional quarterfinals of soccer. That's like one of those yeah. undercover teams that yeah. you don't want to see come playoff time. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely getting out of District 14-5A last year. <laughs> they, Helped they them out a ton, Definitely man. been brighter horizons for them in District 11-5A. And yeah, you see that with the softball team. They've manhandled that district all season long. Um, and they entered the one seed, and they lived up to that billing, and then some a 26-0 victory for the Creekview Lady Mustangs against Dallas Samuel. Um, this was one that, um, you know, you got to play the five innings, you know, in the playoffs and whatnot. But, yeah, nevertheless, this was, a, uh, this was actually a scoreless game after the first inning, and then... 10 runs for Creekview in the second inning, 12 more in the third inning. And you know how I feel bad for them? if they had a Samuel beat writer there covering that game. Where do, where do you go with that story? Like, I mean, you start with the <laughs> the errors. I mean, the, the ten errors, and I don't know. Oh, it's the way you go. Yeah, because that was the thing. Like, it wasn't like it wasn't so much how overwhelming the uh, you know the Creekview offense was. They had 13 hits, and granted, it sounds yeah. like they put a ton of balls in play. Yeah. But nevertheless. Um, Ten errors um, on Samuel's end, and that'll—I mean—that'll obviously do any team in. Yeah, it makes regardless of the situation. The main thing: how did they get to the playoffs? <laughs> Weaker district. Yeah, it's a four seed. You know, yeah. It's a four seed coming from a district that's you know not necessarily the caliber of of eleven five at the very least. And Creepy stay rank for a reason, so you're going to see outcomes like that. But yeah, of the twenty six runs scored by Creepy, only nine earned. So you know Samuel's defense definitely playing a hand in that as well. But you know you got your usual great stuff in the circle from uh, from KK Larkin. You know she throws only needs to throw three innings. You know it's just two hits allowed, four strikeouts. Just a a pretty uh. Pretty easy day in the office yeah. for Lady Mustangs, all things considered. And now things will uh, ramp up pretty significantly, though, in the second round for them. And you wonder how they kind of will handle that. Uh, this will be the first test that they've had, though, in quite some time. So you wonder how much the uptick and difficulty is going to, uh, you know, play out in this uh, in this upcoming series in the second round. Um, elsewhere, we, we did mention, though, um, you know, old, uh, Independence. Um, any any takeaways on what the uh, the Lady Knights were able to accomplish in their series? And they look good. Yeah, they look real good with the sweep. Uh, they're in the first round. Now they take on Woodrow Wilson. That's a, a one-game series. You know that that could, has the makings of you know possibly you know maybe being a blowout. You know Woodrow Wilson not coming from the you know the toughest softball districts uh, as well. There, I, I'm assuming Woodrow Wilson won the flip there to make it a one-game uh, series. Anything can happen in those games, but uh, they take on Woodrow Wilson uh, at Allen uh, tonight. Uh, and like I said, in the one-game playoff. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was Little Elm. Yeah, yeah. When, <laughs> when, you, when, 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 when you mentioned how each game in that Lone Star McKinney North series was its own entity you know the same thing was for Little Elm against Grapevine they lose game one seven to four Mm -hmm. they gave up some early runs in that game and Lauren Lucas kind of had one of her uh, not so typical outings she had a ho-hum yeah I mean it was it was very un-Lauren Lucas like performance and 
uh, team maybe got rattled a little bit early in that game, and then they bounce back in game two. Lauren Lucas gets back to a normal self. They went 3 1. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I make it out to, to Irving Nimitz for big game three Saturday afternoon, and Little one wins 13 to nothing. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I walk out onto the, the field after the game. I'm like, Coach, where was this all series? I mean, it was, they scored six runs in the first inning. They were putting tons of balls in play, four hits. Uh, and then they had another monster five run third inning later. Lauren Lucas throws a no hitter. This was a run roll, so it was only five innings. Uh, but she throws a no, a no hitter nonetheless, 10 strikeouts. She also led the way with three RBIs, two hits in this game. That's. Uh, in my mind, that's district MVP worthy right there. We'll see how they vote that out. But, uh, but yeah. He's not even here to defend this. No, nope. <laughs> that's why I said it. <laughs> but yeah, so they, they, they blow out great mind. Uh, it was 13 to nothing. Now they take on Mansfield Legacy, mm -hmm. which should be, should be a, a good series. All three of those games will be at Grand Prairie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you think of uh, you know Region One Five A, we talk little. Um, also, got to mention the Colony. The Lady Cougars had a uh, had a strong start to the first round um, of their own. Um, they sweep Birdville away, advance in two games that were relatively low scoring. Not the you know usual you know the Colony just racking up you know 10, 15 runs a pop. You know they win these games just four to one and three to zero. So then you got to kind of start with just the performance in the circle by Carly Charles, who's got to be on the uh, right at the front of the line for uh, for Pitcher of the Year candidates as far as um, eight five A goes. You know she throws two complete games. I want to say she only allowed like I don't know what four, five, six hits over the course of the entire series. Mm -hmm. You know, even though Birdville was the four seed, that's still a program that does have some pretty proud tradition when it comes to softball. So certainly not an opponent that can be overlooked. And obviously Birdville, I mean, you know, with a pitcher of Grace Green's caliber in the circle, I mean, that's that alone will give you a fighting chance most nights. And she did well, all things considered, against that lineup. You know, only holding the colony just to seven total runs over the course of that series. Um, you know. But if you're just looking for constants within the Colony's offense, obviously much like Lauren Lucas as far as MVP candidates in 8-5-A goes, Jada Coleman, you know, submitting a near-perfect series in her own right. You know, she goes 4-4, draws four walks. Um, she scores, let's see, she had a... Let's see, scores two. If four, you haven't seen her play, she, she's yeah. very electrifying. She scored four of their seven runs in the series. I mean, it's just what you're usually getting from one of the absolute best softball players in the country. And obviously, uh, you know, bigger fish to fry for the Colony as they now embark on a postseason run that, um, you know, the expectation is to get to state. So we will, uh, we shall see. But nevertheless. Yeah, guys, all roads go through Forney, though, from what I'm hearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. As far as getting oh, to state, though, yeah. they're in Region 2, <laughs> oh, though. Yeah. Have, yeah, I mean, Colony the Little Elm, none of these Region 1 teams have to worry about them until way okay. down the road. So uh, nevertheless, so, yeah, Colony and Little Little Elm, two very, very productive starts to the postseason as well. And, um, and yeah, that's a look at uh, at least things on the 5A side of the uh, first round of the playoffs. We did mention Michaela Wark earlier on, Brian, one of the key contributors to that uh, that impressive win for Reedy. And uh, Michaela Wark was the subject of our student athlete spotlight. Brian had a chance to swing by Reedy, talk with Michaela on the uh, on Reedy's uh, start to the playoffs and her season and whatnot. And we will see what she had to say after a word from this sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Star Local Media. 14 newspapers and websites with a print distribution of 270,000 homes and monthly page views of 600,000 online. Star Local Media, your community voice for news. And now, let's get back to the podcast. All right, I'm with Reedy pitcher Michaela Wark. Michaela, y'all played a, y'all had switched things up today with those playoff schedule with all the rain and, and, and whatnot. Y'all faced state-ranked Creekview. Y'all coming off a big 10-1 uh, win. Uh, how big was it to grab that first uh, game one victory uh, in this second round series? Um, it's good with the rain. You don't know like what what's going to happen with the games, so it's good to get that number one spot for like the first game. Now, last week y'all are coming off y'all's first ever playoff win. You know, last year y'all had to play the Colony in the first round. It's almost not fair having to face those guys. You know, could win the state championship uh, like they did a couple years ago. But you know, beating Lovejoy in that game, it was a back and forth game. You know, how awesome was that to to win that first ever playoff game? And it was a one game series, so it was y'all's first ever playoff series win too. Yeah, it was really nerve wracking at first. We got up there, and then once we got settled, it was a good game. It was really exciting since we did break history with the first um, win in the playoff in the playoffs. So it was great for us. Now, how cool is it to be doing all of this, you know, with your older sister Maya? You know, y'all bat, you know, bat, uh, you know, next to each other in the lineup, and y'all are two of the team's most important players. You know, first off, what's it like, you know, playing with your sister? Oh, it's so much fun. We get we get along really well, and it's really fun having her by my side. We switch off and on on pitching and stuff, so it's really fun. Had y'all prior to coming to Reedy, had y'all played on the same team before? Um, when we were younger, we did, but since we are different ages, we kind of grew like apart. 
And now is there kind of like a little sibling rivalry? I know you're a pitcher and she's, you know, y'all play different positions right. and stuff, but are y'all like, hey, I'm trying to get, you know, I got more RBIs this game or I got a home run this game. Or is there kind of like a little yeah, it's more friendly competition? We both push each other to do our best in practice and tell each other like to get it straight. We got it. Now y'all are y'all are a young team, you know, a lot of a lot of sophomores and juniors, you know, on this team, you know, y'all got a lot of, you know, good experience, you know, last year making the playoffs. Uh, what's it going to take, you know, for y'all to make a to make a deeper run this year, albeit being a young team with, you know, still lots of experience left to gain? Right. Um, I think just working, like continuing to work hard in practice, just um, keep getting those extra reps, like take every rep like it's the game like, and just keep pushing through. Now, who are some of the young players, some of those sophomores, maybe a freshman that have really stepped up this year uh, into big roles? Um, Allie Ryan, she's a freshman. She's the only freshman, so it's a little pressure on her, but she stepped up big time. And all my sophomores, yeah, we're... Now, how tight is that sophomore group? Because I know Tony, your second baseman, she's a sophomore. You're a sophomore. There's so many sophomores that start on this team. How tight knit is that group? Yeah, we're pretty tight. It's me, Tony, Maddie, and Ashlyn. We're all pretty tight. We um, we all play on Glory, Texas Glory. So it kind of we have this bond. Now, do most of the other you know teams around the district have so many certain amount of players that play you know summer ball on the same team together, or are, are y'all unique in the in the you know in the way that you know y'all have so many from the same team playing here at Reedy? Right. Yeah, it's fun playing against other teams because we do know so many players like from Glory from other teams. So it's really fun ha having that competition, just being on different teams. But when we do get to summer ball, it's fun to play together. Now, one last thing before I let you go, y'all still have at least one more game against Creekview. They've came in, I think, 23 and two or some 23 and three or something like that. You know, blowing a lot of teams out. The way y'all were able to beat them in game one here earlier today, just a couple of hours ago, you know, how, what is that going to do for y'all's confidence and what's it going to take to close them out and not let a game three happen later this weekend? Right. We know we, we knew they were going to be tough, a tough competition because they have won all their games. And we just, we knew that we need to come out and just do our best, um, play our game, not, don't mix it up, don't do anything else. Just stick to what we did, start, stick to what we practiced and stick to our game. Thanks again to Michaela Wark for taking the time to chat with Brian for our student athlete spotlight. And uh, hey, look, it's just me and Devin Hassan. What's up, buddy? <laughs> What's going on? We're going to, I guess, yeah, round out the podcast. You know, we've talked softball, and obviously, softball is very, very front of mind right now as far as our coverage goes. But we did just have the NFL draft last week, and one of the rare years in which Star Local Media has a pretty, pretty firm tie to the draft as far as the, uh, as far as who gets picked and who, and just some of the notable storylines for the draft. I mean, for Star Local Media's first ever number one overall pick say. in the draft, and that's. That's kind of where, I mean, if you're going to do any sort of draft recap, you kind of have to start there because the, the Kyler Murray story is really, I mean, there's really nothing to compare it to in college well, athletics. I mean, just a kid who wasn't even on draft radars at this time last year. And just to turn in the, the year that he did at Oklahoma, I mean, it basically looked like just another, I mean, just like pick any of the three seasons at Allen, and that's pretty much what you saw this past year at Oklahoma. To parlay that into being the number one overall draft pick, it really was, I mean, kind of a perfect storm of events in some circumstances but um yeah, I mean yeah I mean you were watching the draft Devin I'm sure I mean just I mean just what was your reaction just to the Kyler Murray story really coming full circle with him being the number one pick in the draft well you know I number one I'm happy for him yeah. I've always thought Kyler was a good kid I mean you know we you had the chance to obviously see probably him more than anybody else around mm -hmm. uh, outside of his coaches in, in high school but you know I, I had a chance to see him uh, play a handful of times and you know I, I sat there and I, th I had the same opinion I think as everybody that's one of the if not the best, one of the top three high school football players that I'll ever see. Yeah. But in no way back then did he jump out and I said, that kid's going to be playing in the pros one day. <laughs> I mean, he just, you know, he didn't seem to have the stature and he seemed to have a game that was perfectly suited for that system at Allen. Mm. And he was just such a better athlete than everybody else on the field. But. You know, and, and he's he's had a. It hasn't been the smoothest ride. You know, going through the the, the transfer. You know, from A and M and the. It's it's so unique because yeah, the, so things just don't work out at A and M. He has to sit two years at Oklahoma just because. I mean, again, he transferred to OU, and that was before the Institute of the Rule that allowed Baker Mayfield to stay an extra year. Mm -hmm. So Kyle's got to wait two years, and you just got to think just the patience that something like that requires for a kid who, with the success that he has enjoyed or he had enjoyed, you know, just every chapter of his career up until then. I mean, that's a lot. That's a pretty 
trying moment for a kid. Well, and, and I think that proved a lot of the doubters wrong because they sat there, uh, a lot of the people, and a lot of them were a &M guys, um, but that was one of the things they were holding against him. He just doesn't want to wait his turn. He doesn't want to fight for a job. He wants it handed to him. He wants it, mm -hmm. you know, and I think he proved a lot of people wrong when he was willing to sit there and say, hey, I I'm going to sit back. I'm going to learn. I'm going to improve. And when I get my chance, I'm going to be ready. And I mean, was he ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the one of the greatest individual seasons ever submitted by a college quarterback culminates in him winning the Heisman Trophy, and then the draft process starts. And I mean, just where do you begin? Everything from the baseball versus the football to how tall is he? You've never seen a player, or a prospect whose height was more of a storyline, and I, just when he measured, what was the exact measure? It was like five ten and a quarter, something like that. Well, or? and it, when I saw I saw him at the. Uh, the state football championships mm -hmm. this year back yeah. in December he was presenting the trophy to a couple of the state champions and I saw half a dozen people that literally would walk over behind him and just like to measure <laughs> to, to see how how tall they, he was Aww. compared to them and then they come over and now there's no way because I'm I'm 5'11 and he's he's and you know it was just yeah it was the most overly scrutinized yeah. uh, measurable that I can remember like what would the cutoff have been like as uh, so what was it was it was it 5'10 and a quarter was he officially measured at the combine something like that like if he had been like 5'9 and 7'8 yeah that have then been he dropped like, to the sixth like, round yeah, yeah. I, I mean there, there's no yeah you can knock on and I understand how important measurables are at, at least how why scouts look into it yeah. uh, especially in terms of the quarterback position but we've all seen that to be very overrated yeah. too when you can play you can play you know you see guys that drop in the draft just because they're not you know Drew Brees mm -hmm. you know if you do it all over again you can knock you're gonna pass on him in the first round just because he's you know 5'10 5 5'11 5 you know whatever there's just so many uh, you know cases of that mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah yeah it's, it's, it was an incredible process and then you you know even the day of you had you know the rumors that the Cardinals even though it was pretty much thought that they were gonna take him uh, well they're actually kind of shopping elsewhere they're gonna look at that Quinn and Williams they're gonna go you what know a, what a smoke and, screen and, 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 yeah and then within all of a sudden like oh he could tumble to the middle of the first round now you know and it just <laughs> it was I mean it's part of what makes the draft so you know intriguing mm -hmm. to watch but especially when it's uh, it's one of our own in terms of being a local product mm -hmm. uh, at the center of it all it was it made it even more all oh, the yeah. more fascinating it's as, it's as invested in the draft as I've been <laughs> yeah. I mean like I said I saw this kid a ton back in high school so yeah just to see it all come for full circle for Kyler uh, yeah, I'm obviously, you know, you, you hope good things for him. You know, we'll see. I mean, it's on paper. You'd feel like him and Cliff Kingsbury are a match made in heaven with what Kingsbury was able to do with Texas Tech and just how wide open that offense could be. I mean, we'll see. But nevertheless, um, yeah, Kyler Murray, the number one overall pick in the draft. Something that would have just seemed so far-fetched at this time last year. Yeah, and, and, and obviously not the last time that Allen High School was brought up during the no, uh, this draft. No, this was a, uh, yeah, this was the Allen draft. If, um, yes, I, uh, I had the tweet after, um, after the second day of the draft that if you were just um, just through the first three rounds that if you're gonna take your your major power uh, your power colleges in Texas and as you looked you know you had I mean what was it uh, you know TCU in Texas had zero kids taken or no it was in TCU it was TC it was Texas and Texas Tech I'm sorry mm -hmm. they, had, they had zero kids taken then you had Houston had one Baylor had one TCU and A&M they each had two Allen had three. <laughs> Allen had three kids picked within the first uh, three rounds of the draft. You had Kyler going number one overall. You had uh, Greg Little. You know, and this is—I mean—it was a big moment for Allen's offensive line. As I mean, I've—you know—I've been saying for a while that that has been throughout the course of the Allen dynasty. That is the most consistently dominant positional group. You know, just over the uh, over the over the years has been that offensive line. You had Greg Little pick number thirty-seven of the Carolina Panthers early in the second round, and then Bobby Evans out of Oklahoma taken near the. Into the third round, number 97 to the uh, to the LA Rams. You know, uh, Greg's a player who I mean had um, you know all the makings of, a, of an NFL prospect pretty much from the moment that he uh, that he stepped on stepped foot in, uh, in Allen and he was a five star prospect, one of the top players in the in the country. He was you know kind of projected a little bit higher you know than he wound up getting getting picked. You know there was a, there were times this year where he was you know being mocked as a you know as a potential top 10, top 15 you know pick. And nevertheless, so he does slip to the early second round. Doesn't mean he can't be a good pro or anything. Yeah. And nevertheless, and it does sound like. You know, Carolina has drafted him with the expe expectation of him being their uh, their long term left tackle, and then you have uh, Bobby Evans.
Ravens. There's actually now a lot of star local media flavor with the LA Rams because we have <laughs> Joseph Noteboom with Plano as a uh, as their um you know, their backup left tackle. We'll see how Bobby Evans slots into things, and then you had um you know players like uh, you can talk about talk about your guy Devin. So you yeah, just mentioned Texas. You know Texas didn't have anybody drafted those first uh, those first two days. The Longhorns do get a couple though, end up getting picked, including uh, Charles Omenihu, who's now bound for uh, what the Houston Texans. Houston Texans, yeah. He uh, he goes in the fifth round, pick uh, number one sixty one overall. Uh, I'd seen projections where he even as high as the second round. Um, but you know he's he's getting a chance, mm -hmm. and I mean this is just. Uh, I, I remember back when he was he wasn't he was a three star and he was good enough to get offered by Texas, one, a major D one program. But you know he wasn't uh, he didn't have star written all over yeah. him. And um, I remember talking to the Rowlett coaching staff back then, and they say keep an eye on him. So number one, he's only been playing for a couple of years. He's still learning the game. And number two, he's young. He's 17. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he was 17 when he got to Austin, but the fact is they said, you know, he's going to, you know, grow mentally because he's still learning the game, but he's also going to grow physically. And he did during his time at Texas. He's up, you know, on draft. He measured out at 6'6", 275, which was a far cry from the, you know, 6'3", 205, you know, kid yeah. he was at, at Rowlett. So, you know, he's, he's a guy who worked hard. Um, again, wasn't an immediate starter coming in, but uh, came back this year. Uh, I know there was some thought about him coming out early. I think that probably would have been a mistake. He probably wouldn't have been drafted uh, as it stood. But he came back for, he said he had some unfinished business, and he goes out and he wins Big 12 Defensive Lineman of the Year. Just really made an impact. Made, a, made, made an impact in big games. In the Big 12 Championship game against Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first meeting against Oklahoma, made big plays. Uh, and, and certainly in the, in the Sugar Bowl game against Georgia, he was, he was all over the field so I mean he just you know he really you know kind of made a reputation for himself and and paid it off I saw a video of him on Twitter you know getting the, the phone call you know from Houston that mm -hmm. you know you after waiting and waiting and waiting you get that uh, that moment where your dream comes true so you know, really happy for Charles, and uh, I don't know if this is 100% factual, <laughs> but I did see, because it was, it did come from a, a Rylett Twitter site, but uh, they said that uh, behind only Allen, yeah. uh, Rylett has the second most active uh, NFL players now uh, of any of the 1,217 high schools in Texas. Wow. So, I mean, so he joins uh, Marquise Goodwin out in San Francisco, and Demontre Moore in Miami, and uh, Zach Wood, who plays mm -hmm. for the third New Orleans. So, um, pretty impressive. I mean, whether that's 100% oh, factual yeah, hey. or not, having Four active NFL <laughs> players is not is not, is not a uh, claim that most pe in the high schools can make. I'm not sure how many guesses it would have taken for me to guess that Rowlett would be uh, oh, second yes. behind only Allen. Because with Allen, yeah, in addition to Kyler Murray, great little Bobby Evans, I and mean, you've got guys like Cedric Obwehi, who's now with the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars, another offensive lineman that was yeah. taken back in Allen. So like I said, it's just been it's been a pretty impressive few years for that Allen offensive line. Uh, you know, shout out to their offensive line coach Mike Carter, who's you know among the top line coaches in the in the state. And just that program just con continually produces just uh, pro prospects at that at that at that position and then you, know, you got guys like Stephen Terrell Jonathan Williams I mean Allen's there's there's plenty of Allen Eagles circulating the the NFL yeah. ranks these days um, you also had a guy like Caden Smith of, uh, of Marcus who I mean that's you know if there was a you know for all the all the star power that Allen had back you know during that uh, that time frame from 2000 uh, you know 12 to 2015 there were some years where they shared a district with Marcus and Marcus was often the team that gave Allen you know the uh, the, the biggest run for their money during district play in a lot of that was because nobody on Allen could cover Caden Smith. Nobody in the state could cover Caden Smith for that matter. You know, that stud tight end out of Marcus, he ends up getting, uh, you know, getting picked in the sixth round, number 176 overall to the San Francisco 49ers. So, I guess to say local, he's a Stanford product, so he got mm -hmm. to stay on the West Coast, nevertheless. Obviously, uh, yeah, you know, when you think of the 49ers, you know, it's kind of a depth selection. Obviously, they've got one of the top tight ends in the uh, in the NFL with George Kittle, but nevertheless, yes, Caden Smith getting a chance to uh, parlay his uh, his craft to the uh, to the professional level. And then we had, um, you know, some, uh, some under Drafted free agents, mm -hmm. some kids who did not necessarily hear their names called during the draft, but are still going to get a chance to to vie for a spot on a 53-man roster or a practice squad, what have you, including a, a sexy kid, if I recall. Yeah, Devon Zigbo mm -hmm. um, went to Nebraska. He's he's another one that really kind of break broke out his senior year. Um, he was part of a you know they basically running back by committee there for so many years at Nebraska. But his senior year, he became became the go-to kid. And uh, there was a chance, I mean, I saw him projected to be taken in the sixth or seventh round in a couple of these. But, uh, you know, in, in this case, like I say, he's going to New Orleans. Um, 
I, I know just by reading kind of his responses and, and whatnot uh, through social media that you know he's just give me the opportunity and that's all any of these guys especially the undrafted free agent guys uh, are, are wanting is yeah. an opportunity if you can get your foot in the door and you know you look at a guy like Taylor Gabriel who yeah, went to exactly. Horn he had a standout career at Abilene Christian uh, undrafted free agent he was given a chance Cleveland gave him a chance he made a few plays ends up going to Atlanta and uh, you know, just last year he signs four years, twenty-six million dollar contract with Chicago, oh, yeah. and that coming from somebody who again didn't hear his name called on draft day, and now he's he's living the dream. Very very prominent player during their uh, their run of the Super Bowl a few years mm -hmm. ago out of the out of the slot. Then you had guys like you know another Allen kid. So Allen has four kids total that end up uh, you know getting uh, you know associated with the draft one way or another. Uh, Jalen Guyton, wide receiver, he was uh, Kyler's Kyler's deep threat back during the uh, you know those uh, the three state titles, and um, you know he ends up signing. He's got actually going to be staying close to close to home. He signs uh, as an undrafted free agent with the Cowboys. Uh, you know, Guyton, a player who um, he had kind of a, a unique journey as well. You know, he was, you know, you know, initially going to Notre Dame. Things don't necessarily work out there for him. And then he resurfaces as a uh, as one of the stud receivers out of North Texas over in Denton. You know, he earns, I want to say, conference newcomer of the year honors. Just really, really blossomed during his time with the uh, with the Mean Green. And uh, yeah, he'll, he's now bound for the uh, for the Cowboys. You had Landis Durham. It was kind of the opposite. Landis Durham was just an absolute Iron Man for Texas A&M. You know, grinded about four, uh, you know, all four years. Landis Durham of Plano East. You know, he carves out a uh, a nice role for himself as a linebacker there, as um, you know, one of their as one of their top defenders this past season. You know, he was signed as an undrafted free agent to the Rams, and then um, with Lake Dallas, you have Josiah Tawaifa who was uh, signed as an undrafted free agent with the uh, with the New York Giants. Uh, Josiah, who uh, you know comes from the, uh, Texas San Antonio, and um, a player who had just a monster freshman campaign. I remember he was, I mean, on the arguably the best arguably the best defensive year that a freshman's ever had at UTSA. <laughs> and I'm um, you know looking at what he's been able to parlay parlay that into since. So uh, you know Lake Dallas, uh, you know you don't not too often you get Lake Dallas, you know, with the you know players bound for the NFL. But this is not the second straight year they had Josh Jackson picked mm -hmm. as a second rounder last year uh, by the Packers so uh, yeah Lake Dallas getting uh, getting some love in the NFL draft and um, I don't know was there I mean I don't know is there anybody else that we left off I know it's on, with undrafted free agents you know you, you, you know, know there's always there are a few kids that I'm sure that we're missing but and, well you know and, and there's there's no timetable it's not yeah. as if they have a, a 24 or 48 hour window yeah. to snap everybody up I mean this you could have we could have local products you know two months from now mm -hmm. that get a look and, and get signed on to, to come to you know once training camp really starts to get rolling here you know this summer so um you know, there's still, there's still, you know, I think a good chance that we'll have, you know, two or three more kids uh, with local ties that they get their shot at the dream. Yeah, that is a look at, uh, yeah, some of the uh, local takeaways from the uh, from the NFL draft. Plenty of star local media kids bound for the NFL. Um, hey, Devin, appreciate you for tagging along for this. Mm -hmm. And that'll, uh, that will do it for this edition of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week to, uh, I guess, recap some of the happenings from the first round of the baseball playoffs. And in the meantime, folks, you enjoy the rest of your week, and we will talk to you all later.